Welcome back. I hope you had the opportunity to digest your lunches. I'm Janice Bergman Carton, the Chair of Art History at SMU, and it's my privilege to introduce the second session of today on community. The word community conventionally refers to particular localities, shared experiences of place, governance, and cultural heritage. But the sufficiency of the local as a source of belonging has been in decline for quite some time. What we're here to consider today is the power of imagined communities, more agile, adaptable, and inclusive. The coinage of the phrase imagined community belongs to Benedict Anderson, who invoked it to explain the social construction of nation building and the benefits of liabi and liabilities of print capitalism that give it form. I'm an appreciative reader of Anderson's work, but today it is the resonance and conceptual frame of his language that I find most useful, imagined community. The American poet Wallace Stevens brings us closer, I think, to the work of the afternoon. In an essay titled Imagination of Value, Stevens writes, quote, imagination is not equivalent to consciousness and reality is not the equivalent to a world that exists outside of our minds, end quote. Rather, these are ideas that are defined by one another. Reality is the product of our imagination in all its limitations and possibilities. Cheryl Mayo and Tom Finkelpearl are speakers in this session on community, like Jason Roberts and Matthew Stadler, who will join them for a panel discussion after share in common a lifelong project of imagining community. They're here today at Meadows because universities remain one of the very few institutional structures with the flexibility, human resources, and privilege of hosting or curating occasions such as this one. We can, if we choose, and here we choose, to generate sites of conversation as one of the ethical imperatives of the modern university. In my own institutional home here at SMU Art History, we engage in a version of this, a project we call, in their less formal manifestations, place settings. Sometimes those place settings are conversations about art, urban design, or poetry among artists, art historians, playwrights, community activists, around meals we take turns cooking for one another. Sometimes place settings are workshops in studios, museum spaces, or charged sites of cultural memory in Dallas that bring together generous minds across and beyond SMU's campus. In a few months, my Department of Art History will launch a more formal and public manifestation of this vision, a PhD program we chose to call ROSCA. The word ROSCA, Spanish for to scratch, is intended as a commitment to a more expansive notion of the academic discipline of art history. My involvement, my department's deep involvement with this symposium and my own opportunity to share this platform with Cheryl, Tom, Jason, and Matthew, four such intelligent, creative, and generous minds who in different parts of the country and in very different arenas of work are all engaged with imagining community. That opportunity underscores the commitments of Rosca. I'm going to introduce all four, again, in the interest of time, before handing over the microphone first to Cheryl. Cheryl Mayer is our first speaker this afternoon. She is the executive director of West Dallas Community Centers, where she manages the programming of four freestanding, comprehensive, community-based centers for at-risk youth. Cheryl brings strong training in public health administration and business to her work in West Dallas and her service on the Dallas County District 3 Public Health Advisory Council, the Dallas Women's Foundation, and the Ryan White Planning Council of Texas. Following Cheryl, we will hear from Tom Finkelpearl, Executive Director of the Queens Museum of Art. Tom came to the Queens Museum following a distinguished career in the arena of art and public space that included leadership positions at PS1 Contemporary Art Center, New York City's per Percent for Art program, and the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. 
Our panelists, our discussants include Matthew Stadler, an acclaimed writer and editor whom we invited to join us from Portland, Oregon, where he is based. Matthew has published four highly acclaimed novels and compiled several anthologies about art, urban planning, design, and sprawl. The recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and writing prizes from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Stadler also is engaged with new practices in publishing as a way to generate alternative forms of public space, imagining community. And finally, Jason Roberts is a musician, IT consultant, great human being, who also happens to be the president and founder of the Oak Cliff Transit Authority and co-founder of Bike Friendly Oak Cliff. Jason formed the, Oak, uh, the nonprofit Oak Cliff Transit Authority in 2006 to revive the Dallas streetcar system, and just last year successfully competed with a group of colleagues for a $43 million grant from the federal government to restore the trolley car to Oak Cliff. Jason is about imagining community. He is a master of imaginative interventions in the spaces of the city of Dallas, interventions that spawn creative afterlives, and in some cases, changes in actual legislation and neighborhood economies. I'll turn the microphone now over to Cheryl Mayo. Thank you, Janice, and thank you all for staying this afternoon. I, can't, I don't know who made the decision that I would be after lunch but I'm definitely going to try to do the very best that I can. Most of my talk is going to focus on West Dallas Community Centers and the work we, we do um, with the children in West Dallas. And then I actually took the time to go through the Creative Time Report. So uh, I will interweave into um, the latter part of my presentation just some thoughts around the report and some things where I thought from a community perspective um, might, to, might continue to enhance our dialogue. In terms of the four sites that Janice mentioned, this is just the address for those locations. Again, they're all located in um, the West Dallas area. In terms of our history, West Dallas Community Centers was actually founded in 1932. So we've been working in the West Dallas area for more than 79 years. Originally, we were founded to help to provide youth with exposure and as a safe haven for kids to keep them off the street, to keep them off of drugs, because at that time, the West Dallas area was one of the poorest communities in the nation. That was around 1999. There were also a number of housing developments, our public housing units in the West Dallas area, as well as other low-income housing, and you'll see those demographics in a moment. Around 1983, we were able to actually apply for federal funds. Most of our funding focused around juvenile prevention, drug intervention, and some of those types of programs, in addition to what we um, provided in the after-school setting. And then just this year, we formed a collaborative with three very um, distinguished organizations. One is Big Thought, which is very prominent in after-school programming here in Dallas, as well as the Boy Scouts, which are prominent all over the nation. And we're really excited about reactivating our Boy Scout troops. We started two Cub Scout troops, two Boy Scout, Scout troops in January, and we now have 42 young men that are excited about scouting. So we're really excited about that. In terms of the demographics of West Dallas, I, um, I gave you a, a snapshot, but in, in 2000, according to the 2000 census, the total population was 22,000. And you have to remember that the West Dallas area is basically an 11 mile square foot area right across um, the bridge from Parkland Hospital, if you're familiar with that area. <clears throat> in terms of the median household income, it's about 22,000. So a large percentage of our residents really live every day um, below poverty level. According to more recent data, 99% of West Dallas children receive free lunch, and it's actually more than 70% of the adult population is functionally illiterate. The other thing you need to know about this small 11 uh, square mile area is that there are 8% more preschool and school age children in West Dallas than in all of Dallas County. So there are a lot of children in the West Dallas area. So what do we do with the children? What do we provide? We have seven components that 
um, are a part of our Success in Life program. We help the children with reading through what we call, we have declared war on reading, so the war program. The World Explorers Health Science program, uh, defeating life's challenges, back on track drug prevention. Um, it takes a village. The financial literacy program we have is called Imagine Me a Millionaire. Our Boy Scout program is actually interwoven into Boys to Men. And then for our young ladies, we have what's called Always a Lady. Although with resources, we could save more, but at this time, our after-school program serves less than 10% of the 7,000 kids I told you about in our community. With the Cultural Expressions Program that was launched in January with the funding from Big Thought, we've actually been able to provide a creative time project that involves two artists, one mentor, along with our staff. For many of our youth, this was the very first time that they had ever been exposed to a long-term artistic program. And you'll hear me refer to creative time throughout the presentation. Now, let's talk about the creative time report, Freedom of the City. Raise your hand, have, have you all had a chance to look at the report? Or are you familiar with it? Great. One of the things that I enjoyed about reading the report, number one is that I adore the word inclusive. And often when you discuss arts and history, um, the dialogue tends to be a, among academicians and they're talking about space and, and your work and that kind of thing. And as a community person, sometimes the dialogue or the terms don't translate into my world. So I like the fact that with this particular um, piece of uh, white paper that we're looking at freedom of the city as well as how do we begin an inclusive dialogue. Um, this slide cut up, let me think. Um, in terms of Dallas and some of the remarks that they shared about Dallas, it said Dallas is uniquely positioned to become a leading force in the large contemporary art world. And one of the things that I liked in terms of this recommendation is the fact that artists need to build their own community, get involved in communities around the studios, and involve the local artist community in exhibition preferences. What we've actually been able to do with the creative time model is actually a response to this recommendation. We've been able to take the artists that were actually in West Dallas to work with our children in an after school setting. So when we think about um, children that want to be like Serena Williams or children that want to be like Michael Jordan, they're exposed to the craft of Serena and Michael because they start seeing it at a very young age. What we've been able to do is take the artists, bring them into the center in an after school setting, and it allows ample time, because they're in our centers every day till 8 p.m. at night. So those children have the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with the artists in terms of creating a program or a production that is all their work. It's what they see in their, within their community. They produce the, uh, their costumes, they produce the stage settings, they do the whole production with the artist. <clears throat> so in terms of how children are expired, how we um, expose children to education, that's just one way that we're doing it in the West Dallas area. We're constantly going to events. So what this recommendation also talks about that's prominent here in the Dallas area is why not make sure that with every event we attend that it includes an artistic component, whether it's performances, dances, visual, um, our theater, and, and Butch McGregor and I were talking earlier about some of the work that's being done in West Dallas in terms of visual art. So how can we get the children from West Dallas community centers to come and participate in those activities? He mentioned that the first time that it was done, there was no one there. But we have a group of children that have now been exposed to all types of art. How do we get them? It's just a matter of taking the children from our after school setting and making sure that they're able to attend the, the exhibition. Um, as a small nonprofit agency, I've seen many reports about the low testing scores of the children in my community. Um, many of our kids, uh, they were going to summer school. They even had longer school hours. Then for some of them, they had to stay after school. And they were doing tutoring, all these things in order to improve the outcomes and some of the testing scores. So I just started asking myself, well, if the way that we're, we're training and we're teaching children now isn't working, what else can we do? 
and remind you, mind you, I'm in a school, I'm in a district, 7,000 children. We have nine elementary schools in, in West Dallas, one middle school, one high school. So you're talking about a large number of children. I serve less than 10%. Private, mid, and small size nonprofits are some of your greatest resources. Um, my staff live in the community, and we've worked in West Dallas for over 30 years. By identifying the artists in our project, we're helping to improve the schools, we're working with the teachers, we're working with the parents, and we continue to see the children every day, and we're able to reinforce some of the messages. So in terms of the recommendation number five, this one talks about five, six, and seven. One of the recommendations included for organizations to be great, they need great leaders. And it suggested that organizations should hire right, invest in training, reward vision, um, and retain the best. This recommendation is uh, applicable to any organization, of course, not just um, arts organizations. The uh, sixth recommendation, and I didn't type the whole thing, but it talked about in this economy, galleries need to be proactive and creative about developing audience and cultivating collectors. And one of the recommendations even included uh, hosting a artist happy hour. Now, I'm all about happy hours. That's, <laughs> that is a wonderful thing at the end of my day. Um, but I never thought about having it as, a, as an art happy hour and including artists and actually having um, an artist to come in and to perform or taking our parents and youth to an event where it's fun, it's festive, but they're also being able to engage and observe art. Remember we talked about Serena Williams and we talked about Michael Jordan. When the artists become involved in the community, they're doing things in the community like the mural that we produce, then that's exposing kids and they're actually seeing it on a consistent basis. So that happy hour kind of lends right into that one. And then create residency programs, expand reach. Uh, linking residents in the community. The great thing about West Dallas now is that um, in, here in 2011, there's a, a phenomenal amount of economic development that is going into the West Dallas area. It is being transformed into a vibrant and integral part of the Dallas community. We are so excited about that. Part of what's happening is the Trinity River Project, where there will be all types of horse parks and, and uh, kayaking and canoeing available for the kids. These are things that, that my children have never seen. They've never been exposed to. Well, how does art play into that? Well, is there space now for us to have outdoor theaters and amphitheaters and those types of things in the West Dallas area? Again, it would be something new to the community, not only to uh, Dallas, but also to the West Dallas area and the children that we serve. But kids don't really, unless you see it, unless you've had a chance to really visualize it, you don't really know what it means. You don't really know how to take um, visual art. You don't know how to incorporate theater into what you do every day. With the Creative Time Project, we've been able to do that. So in terms of the, the recommendations, one way that we might um, implement them is that I told you that in the West Dallas area I have uh, nine schools. There are actually 39 schools within our learning community. I now know that an interactive arts and education curriculum does supplement the growth and development of a child. The model that we have implemented in our centers actually allows children from all of these schools with access to the arts outside of school. So it doesn't always have to be in school. Now if you have teachers that are creative and they're exciting about art, then yes, the arts and education program can actually be in the school during the school time. But that would not preclude us from getting children engaged in activities after school. The model that we've implemented in our centers actually allows children from all of these schools with access to the arts outside of school, and the results have been outstanding. But what if we actually had artistic residents that were assigned or worked with each learning community in the district plus the community-based or nonprofit organizations in the community. Would that enhancement be worth the cost to implement such a strategy? And at West Dallas Community Center, we're actually looking at um, exploring that option with some artistic residents here from SMU. And when, when 
Dr. Corus asked me and said, well, well, what do you think they could do? What are some things that you might want them to help with? And I said, well, I would love to have artists come in and help us develop a program for the fall. This particular creative time project that we've developed is really for um, the spring semester. So in the fall, what's going to happen with all these children that we've exposed to all these artists and to these mentors and spring break, they went to every museum and every gallery between Dallas and Fort Worth. So what happens now? Um, so with the collaboration of a residency program, community-based organizations working with the schools, we can continue to build upon the work that we've already done. Why would we explore how to implement this, rec this recommendation? Um, we cannot continue to have outcomes such as these, and I don't know which learning community you may live in, but what I've provided for you is just a quick snapshot of the TAS scores for 2010, and I, um, I actually downloaded the math, science, and reading outcomes, and <clears throat> what we found, this is just for my learning community, of the 3,134 third graders tested in math, 478 Hispanic, 136 African American children did not meet the standard. That means that those children did not pass. 413 of the fifth graders did not pass the science portion. Well, what does this have to do with what we're talking about today? What we've done is we've actually incorporated arts and education into our after school program. So we took some of the children that, that participated in these, in, they are third, fifth, and sixth graders in the learning community, they were tested. Um, some of them may be included in, the, in these outcomes here as not meeting the standard. But with arts and education and them being able to create their own costumes and their, um, uh, they developed their own scripts. They served as understudies for other children. They created their, their own production. Think of how that improved their diction. Think of how it's improved their posture. Think of how it's improve, improved how they view themselves and how they, they view the community where they work. We also incorporated um, educational programs for the kids, such as uh, kite making lessons. Now, you and I know how we, you know, you go and get a kite and you hope it flies and you put some string on and you just hope the wind blows. The, the, what the kids actually do, they have to create the type. They have to the, create the kite. They have to measure the kite. They have to figure out what type of frame they want to put on the kite. And the, you know, just think about the mathematical and science reasoning that has to accompany them being able to create the kite. During the holidays, they have to make the cookies that we take to the seniors in the community. And if you want to have good cookies, what do you have to do? that you have to make sure you read the instructions, you have to make sure that you're looking at the temperature in the oven, you have to make sure that you're measuring right. All of these things help to enhance um, arts and education for, uh, for the kids that we serve. In terms of the reading, 54 children um, did not meet that particular standard. 298 sixth graders were tested in our community. So how are, we, uh, um, how are we addressing that? Our children actually write about their plays. They write about the artistic experiences that we have. And we've worked with them. And we're, we're, we're working with them to express themselves either on the stage or they can do it through their essays, whichever way they, they choose. Recommendation number eight said it, it suggested that we use academic programs to attract, uh, train, and retain artists, bring the artists to the neighborhood. I think that's wonderful, and I think I've given enough example of that, examples of that. We talked about arts education in public schools. Uh, number 10, uh, art does not have to happen in a studio or a gallery. Public art promotes dialogue and provides opportunities for artists to grow their practice. And it talked about thinking outside the box. I truly believe everything that we're doing in the West Dallas community is, is outside the box. Um, they told many of the children, um, they watch videos, but last Thursday we actually watched them perform the own, their own dance that they created to their own song on stage. They had never, ever done that before. So the results have been amazing. The, the um, recommendation number 11, uh, part of what it talked about, um, was engaging audiences. And that's true. 
um, typically arts events are held in Dallas on one side of town. Now as efforts are being planned to develop the southern side, we are seeing more a more diverse group of events, attendees, and it actually impacts the culture, I think, throughout the whole city. As Dallas is being planned, we have artistic architects, like I saw Mr. Brent Brown here from the um, design studio, and, and the work actually helped, his work actually helps to make sure as West Dallas develops that we're pre preserving the historic as, as well as the, the traditional. We know that Dallas is a great place for artists to live, work, and play. Now we need to make sure that the artists, the traditional artists, and the community artists understand just how great we are. This concludes all of my comments at this time, so I will turn it over to, to Tom. 